This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thanks, everyone. I want to thank Susanna Scott and Ron Rice for inviting me to participate. Uh, and thanks to all the other speakers and everyone in the audience for being here and for your interest in science and sustainability. I'm very honored to be here today. It's good to be back at UCSB. Um, I do want to ask a, a quick question. Anyone here, uh, you know, a scientist or a student of science or want to be a student of science? Any scientists in the room? Oh, that's good. Yes, thanks. Great. OK. Um, now, if you didn't raise your hand, don't worry. You're still implicated in the, in the project of science, um, and which forms the epistemological ground for, for, for everything we do, actually, in modernity. And this, this conference on sustainability will help each of us understand the importance of communicating science to the public. But let me address the scientists first. Um, you probably don't remember the moment you decided not to become an investment banker. Um, but the truth is, instead of making hundreds of millions of dollars on shaky financial instruments, you decided to use cutting edge instruments to explore the boundaries of our knowledge and expand the envelope of human experience. Now, most of this conference will be looking at how scientists communicate with others. And my, my talk it looks at how scientists communicate with their peers in the academy. Also, I'm an anthropologist by training, so I'm gonna focus on important cultural aspects of the communication of science knowledge within the academy. Now, I have to say here, science is big. It's, it's complex. It resists being spoken of in the singular. And uh, so I can't claim to speak for every discipline in this talk. And I'm happy to talk with you later about your own experience. Um, but let me start with this example, which I think a lot of people in the room can relate to. Now, science posters are emblematic of how science has so far failed to move into the digital era and the networked era. Let me ask any, anyone in this room ever give a paper, I mean a poster at a meeting, ever? Okay, it's like everyone, okay. Now let me take you back to the 60s. In this case, it's the 1960s. And way back in 68, say, you could see a lot of things, okay? There's a lot of stuff going on in 68. Um, and you could also find posters, mostly about concerts and, you know, or, or maybe outside of cinemas. But you could not attend a poster session at a science conference. You could not see a science poster because they didn't exist yet. Now, people went to science conferences to give talks or to listen to other people give talks. But here's the problem. Between 1950 and 1970, the number of scientists going through university education and getting jobs nearly tripled. Now, poster sessions were an attempt by academic clubs, those hundreds of professional societies, to deal with this fact. In the early 1970s, academic professional societies started offering poster sessions at their conferences to handle the overflow of people who couldn't be scheduled to give talks. Now, the American Geophysical Fall uh, Union Fall Meeting is a kind of a monstrous example of what happened next. Now, it's not hard to understand why they still do this. Um, Nicholas Rowe, a, a researcher in Finland, has been working to calculate the aggregated scope of science and engineering poster activities worldwide. And his annual figures come to about 1.1 million posters every year, costing more than 2 billion US dollars to make and show. That's about a quarter of NSF's research budget. Okay, and not to mention all the trees, right? Uh, um, although they make Kinko's very happy. Um, these million plus ephemeral physical objects are what we were surrounded by right now. Um, these posters stuck on boards for a couple hours consume nearly 40,000 person years of effort annually. Now UCSB as a campus has about 1,000 faculty, okay? So imagine the entire faculty doing nothing but designing and showing posters for the entire year. Now picture 40 UCSBs worth of effort Okay, and that's, that's, uh, that's the effort it takes 
every year for scientists and engineers to produce and show posters. And remember that each poster will be viewed by an average of fewer than a dozen people. On the other hand, there is normally beer, okay, so, um, and, and there's social interaction at the poster. Now, some years back, I received some funding from the Sloan Foundation to pilot a software platform to support digital poster comments. Now, having some success with this, the next step would require a few years of, of negotiating with dozens of professional associations from the IEEE to hundreds of smaller ones, and the funding for that adventure is still unrealized. Now, posters represent just one of several science communication practices that totally beg to be disrupted, reconfigured, and reimagined given our current access to digital resources and networks. Now, what if a million posters were added to a digital repository every year where they could be discovered and mined for information and made available to the entire planet? Now, until Scholar gets funded, there are places where you can do the, the right thing, as I would say, and um, pop your poster up on the web for other people to find. And Figshare uh, is just one space. Uh, Faculty of a Thousand does some other things too, and people put them up on, on Flickr and elsewhere. Now, early last month, I had the, uh, the great pleasure, and, and somewhat to my dismay, um, the opportunity to uh, listen to Cameron Leyland's talk on uh, communication in science, where he stole you know, half of my ideas. Now, he sees that, or actually, uh, he, he gave a wonderful talk uh, at the Data One Project webinar, which is uh, UCSB's a partner there. And uh, his talk describes three ways that the communication process, uh, practices of science have failed to scale. And he also pointed to new directions where a network social, uh, I mean science communities, might be able to regain the qualities that were, and that maybe should again be the hallmarks of science. Now, let me channel some of Nayland's insights and add a few of my own. First, he grounded his history of science um, not back to the history of publication, but back to the original community in the 60s, and this, this time I'm talking about the 1660s, and the process the original Invisible College in England developed for what they called natural philosophy. And this is a time when the novel concept of sharing information was ar articulated against you know, uh, the existing culture of hoarding and hiding knowledge that was practiced by alchemists. And Boyle himself was an alchemist, but then he became the champion for what we might call open alchemy, okay, or now just science. Um, now, the Royal Society was formed in 1660, and the society promoted this new method, what we now call the scientific method, that was characterized by open communication. Coming from the publication side of things now, uh, since Nayland is at the Public uh, Library of Science, he points to three communication uh, challenges that science actually managed to solve really early on in its infancy. Um, now these things are, uh, are listed here, and let's, let's go through them. Uh, completeness, Boyle science attempted to capture the entire process of doing science so that others could copy this, and even if you couldn't try it yourself, you could know from the record that it was possible to do this. In terms of access, the, the, at the founding moment with the help of the transactions of the Royal Society and other new science journals and books, the goal was to publish and distribute a record of all the science done anywhere, from observations to experiments to findings. Civility, um, included in that original science record um, and, and in, the, in the transactions would be public critiques of the methods and findings and being public they were expected to follow a shared concern for decorum, even if they were highly, highly critical. So Nayland then goes on to describe what happened in the late 20th century, um, where this great scaling issue uh, caused a failure. And for example, you know, there's this tremendous increase in science activity. There's a tremendous increase in uh, data volume and experimental complexity. And there's also a need for advanced computational software. And the funding, although it did also accelerate, didn't accelerate as much as these other uh, issues. So let's look at these more recent communication failures due to scaling. The first one is completeness. Now the scientific record today, you know, grossly lacks completeness in, in, in many arenas 
and uh, and this this is a real issue for a, a lot of people, and it's certainly an issue for reproducible science. You know, what's clear now is that science no longer knows what science knows. Um, in terms of access and distribution, there are lots of elements to this. I'll just touch on a few. You know, we can talk about paywalled science journals that still maintain the arbitrary scarcity of the printed page. We can talk about research libraries that are still the deep pockets for for-profit publishers, and the, and, the, and the lack of publication outcomes for software, data, and, and null results. So a lot of science that's being done is never published in any effective manner or put in a repository. In terms of civility, you know, I'm not going to go into the well-known issues of closed peer review, but I mean, come on, just last month, um, I, I think most of you probably saw this, right? Um, now, one of the solutions to this would be open review, okay, just like in the old days. And a few years back, uh, down at NCS, uh, Cameron, uh, Nalan, and I, and, and uh, a bunch of other people, uh, put together a paper, and this paper is now up on, uh, on PeerJ, uh, where you can take a look at it and find uh, good reasons for open review. Now, science stands at a critical inflection point today. We are at the door of the fourth paradigm of science, where big data and open networking can remake how science is done. Even though science is an early enlightenment project housed in late medieval social organizations, there is still hope. And this hope is open science. What is open science? A lot of people will disagree you know, what goes in there, but at least we're talking about it. In fact, last fall here at UCSB, or actually down on the beach at the uh, Red Lion or whatever it is now, um, there was a, an open science hackathon uh, that was hosted. And the vision of open science that emerged from that event, and that's been emerging for the last, say, 20 years from many places, is grounded on a culture of sharing. A lot of the discussion about open science has been focused on open, focused on open science access uh, publications. But it's really important to note how that last step, those closed publications, that private property at the end of the road, impacted communication styles, tactics, and opportunities all the way back through the data streams and the workflows of science. When you have to deliver your idea as a proven piece of knowledge and a package of intellectual property to a publisher and to your funder, at the end of the process, you start to hide what you think you know from the day you first discover this. Private property publication is like a dam on the communication stream that alters the entire upstream environment. And so when this dam is broken, new practices and cultural logics become available. Now at the hackathon, uh, it took a bunch of mostly postdocs to, to come up with this poster, what they thought open science meant. And this new logic looks remarkably like the culture of science in past centuries. So all we really need to do is reinvent the founding moments, the learning communities, and the communication skills for a science that's reconnected to its roots and fully networked across the planet. Now, the move to open access publications is only the starting point for open science. The goal is to share not only publications, but data and software, workflows, reviews, and even ideas. From the very spark of new intellection to the community reviewed outcomes of a rigorous and reproducible scientific process, all the steps, the tools and methods, the experiments that failed, even those ideas that were never funded can be part of open science. Now, most people talk about open science as a process of pulling the goods of science, scientists away from the for-profit publishers and into public repositories. More recently, there's a move for open repositories for research data products, right, that the, all the agencies now have a mandate that your, your data has to go into public repositories, and also uh, for open access science software. Now, Nalan also blogs, and in his blog, he notes that the current system at least offers a marketplace for some people to make a lot of money and for other people to get tenure. And he's concerned that, uh, that in this new system, those marketplaces could disappear with nothing to actually replace them. So he resists that we take a good look at the goods of science. 
So let's see. Up until the middle of the last century, science, scientists gleaned new knowledge from the objects of study in the real world and transformed these into goods within the academy. And then the academy published their own journals designed to be read by their own members. Now this is, this is kind of a typical graph that social scientists do about stuff where you create two axes and then you, you, know, you put things in quarter, quadrants. And so uh, one of them is, is rivalrous goods okay, and non-rivalrous goods. A rivalrous good is one that if you have it, someone else cannot have it, okay? Now, the only person laughing here is actually Hermione, so, um, and, and someone's gonna be disappointed. An excludable good is one that you can put a fence around, excluding others, and even, you know, charge money for it. So private property is rivalrous and excludable, and public property is non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Now, the real world down in the bottom left is rivalrous only in the sense that the, the scientist that discovers something first gets to claim that discovery. So what happened? Okay. When the Academy used private publishers to scale up its published output, it transformed its club goods into private goods, and scientists were forced to buy their own research results. Now, commonly, the view of open science is just this large arrow that's pulling back from the private goods and popping these into public repositories, okay? Um, but there's more to that, and I just want to spend the last few minutes on, on what really open science needs to do. This new science commons and these emergent expanding open resources for data, software, and research results can only realize the potential of their own network effect when scientists are able to manage and mine these commons effectively. These science commons will provide a whole new object of study, although it's not that new. NCS has been doing synthesis for a long time. Um, and a radical return to the old science culture of sharing. And within a decade, there will be hundreds of repositories for software, data, and research results. And we're gonna to need to work together to mine these resources for new knowledge. And we must build new tools for this endeavor and new stewardship practices. And we'll need new science communities capable of transdisciplinary work and are dedicated to a common vision of open science. Community-led, volunteer-run science organizations are at the center of how the sciences can grow the communications and stewardship skills to pull value from these new science repositories. Now, a pioneer in this effort was the Federation of Earth Science Information Partners. And one reason they had to jump on this is that they were mining uh, data that's been openly served by government uh, archives for decades. So for years now, they've been building, uh, as volunteers, sort of new practices on how to use these data. And then more recently, the Research Data Alliance. Anyone here know about the Research Data Alliance? Okay, yeah, which is, uh, is started up uh, in, in Europe, and there's a, uh, the NSF is sponsoring the US version of this. Um, now, it's a little early to tell if the research data is grand scope. They cover all the disciplines, even the social sciences, uh, maybe even the humanities, okay? If, if that will be sustainable. Now, EarthCube is the NSF's latest attempt at getting data and domain scientists to work together. Now, for some years, I've heard government agencies and their leads stand up you know, in front of groups and say something like this, we need to transform how we do science. And this transformation, they used, you know, usually pointing at us, is half technical and half social. Well, they don't ever mention culture, of course, so I've just pulled half of the social into cultural here. And when the next proposal round is opened, I can guarantee that all the money goes into the technical. So logically, this would mean that we've already solved a whole bunch of the technology problems, and what's left is mostly social and cultural. And NASA and NOAA have started to figure this out, and NSF is trying to figure out how to start figuring this out. But how much would it really cost to move that cultural needle and to build a launching pad for open science? How much do you think that's half the problem? Well, it doesn't cost very much. It costs about half of 1% of the research budget um, to tackle half the problem. 
Now, there are many reasons why funding agencies should be attracted to funding volunteer science organizations, and I put a lot of these reasons on, on my blog, Virtual Democracy, that you can look at. The return on investment is spectacular over time. All the agency needs to do is fund the support organization, and the real work is done by the volunteers. And let me make a statement here that needs to be tested further, but it's already evident in open software uh, arenas. Only community-governed science organizations can reliably engineer new internal cultural practices that they can spread across the academy. These models for the culture of sharing are integral to the future of open science. There are also some things that only volunteers can accomplish because volunteering opens up a whole framework of interpersonal communication, emotional attachment, and the trust that supports the qualities of sharing. And without widespread sharing, the new open science content repositories will fail to realize their potential. And the science will lose the one great opportunity it now has to actually know what science knows. Well, what about rivalry in science, okay? Is that always a bad thing? I don't think so. I mean, we do need science posters, okay? We need a new kind of science poster. And I want to thank Kevin for this information here. Uh, rivalry over publicly shared support for competing hypotheses is just good competition, and it makes a good story, okay? Besides, the glory of being smart should be right up there with the glory of being strong or fast or pretty or whatever popular cultures decide to, it should be of value. In fact, I'm going to close with the idea, I think, maybe the only thing I say today that everyone in the room can agree with. Perhaps the best result of forming new volunteer-run science organizations is that these provide forums for scientists to talk together, talk with each other, and to work to develop those stories that they can use. These conversations can then be the foundation for engaging with others and opening the entire discourse of science to the broader society. Thank you.